Okay. Well, thank you ever so much for coming. Um, I, I hope you enjoy this. I know that the Tudors are very popular. People here know a lot about them. I hope that some of the pictures I'll, I'm going to show you, you maybe don't know so well. And certainly some of the, the documents I'm going to show you, you might not have come across before. Um, but I, don't, I think the, it, it's interesting how Hartford and this area actually connects with national history through these children growing up in, in, in this area. So what, um, what, we're, what I'm going to do is first look at Henry VIII's three legitimate children and their mothers and that these are obviously Edward, Mary and Elizabeth. Um, then I'm going to look at the places that they grew up and I'm principally concentrating on Hartford Castle itself, um, Hunsdon, which was a royal palace, and Hatfield, which we all know, and, and it's Hatfield, the old palace, not, not the present Hatfield house. Um, so first, first we'll get them born. This next section is about their early life here. The following section is when they get a bit older, um, and become some of them teenagers. Not that that's a Tudor concept at all. That's the, our present way of describing that um, age. And then finally, I've got a section called Coming to the Throne, where I want to look at the relationships between these three and how they um, alter when they get power, responsibility, um, particularly responsibility in religion. So that's, that's what we're up to. Here is their father. Um, obviously, they all three have different mothers, so they are um, half siblings to each other. But the whole of this really is um, set off by Henry and his desire to have a son, which becomes totally obsessive with him. Um, it has profound consequences, both for the women involved, the children involved, and all the rest of his subjects, actually. And some of those consequences are very much with us today. So um, it's it's his desire for a son has really shaped our country in quite considerable, considerable ways. That's him by Hans Holbein, looking very splendid. But I now want to turn to his first three wives. I'm not going, going to talk about the last three because obviously they didn't actually have any children with him. Um, right, so Catherine of, Catherine of Aragon, a Spanish princess, um, mar married Henry in 1509. Um, she was a devout Roman Catholic, rather older than Henry. Many years later, obviously, the Henry wanted to divorce her because she wasn't able to have further children. Um, and the Pope wouldn't let him, and he effectively made himself head of the church in England. We, we, that, that's the, the, the sorts of bits of history that we all know. Now, Henry VIII had actually been quite pleased when in 1516, um, Catherine of Aragon had a daughter, a healthy baby, named Mary. He said that Mary was a right lusty princess. He was also heard to say to an ambassador, we are both young. 
If it was a daughter this time, by the grace of God, sons will follow. And sadly, as we know, sons didn't follow. Um, and, and in 1533, Henry divorced Catherine and married his second wife, Anne Boleyn. She was much younger than Catherine of Aragon and apparently had eyes which were black and beautiful. She was English but had grown up in France. Henry was so desperate to have a son that when she became pregnant, they were convinced that it would be a boy. It couldn't be anything else. It had to be a boy. But, obviously, in 1533, Anne had a little girl, Elizabeth. Um, and the birth announcements with, for this child had to be altered at that point. I'm going to show you some in the minute so you can see what I, I mean. Um, and when Anne failed to have another living child, Henry had her beheaded, said she'd been unfaithful to him, including that she'd com committed incest with her own brother. Now, birth announcements. Don't try and read this. <laughs> it's in what's called secretary hand, and it's a very unreadable thing, but... Um, I'll tell you, I, this is a shortened version of it. it it's, um, it's quite hard to read out loud as well as everything else. So, what, what happened was bef while Anne will, was still pregnant, they wrote out announcements to send out when the baby w was born. Um, this is a ch shortened version. We greet you well. It hath pleased Almighty God to send us the bringing forth of a princess to the great joy of my Lord, us, and all his good and loving subjects. Now, I've blown up the, the crucial bit. Um, if you... If you look at the blown up bit and look at the third line in the middle, you should be able to see the word prince. And then it runs into the next word because they had to put in an S to make it a princess. Um, and they hadn't left themselves any space to, the, to, the, to do this. Um, and as I said, there were lots of these. So this one um, was sent to a man called Lord Cobham. This one was sent to um, the mayor of Coventry. And in this one, it's still the third line down in the middle. This time they put a tiny S above the end of the word. You probably can't see that. I, I couldn't get a better slide of this. And David Starkey has said that these altered birth announcements for Elizabeth are among the most interesting and re revealing documents that have survived about her life. Um, now we've got one more wife to consider in this. Jane Seymour, this is a portrait by Hans Holbein. Jane Seymour was the third wife and had been lady in waiting both to Catherine of Aragon and then to Anne Boleyn. Both of those queens died in 1536 and Henry mar married um, Jane two weeks after Anne Boleyn had been executed, so really fast. Um, she was very di different from Anne Boleyn. Her mo Jane's motto was, was bound to obey and serve. You can see Henry liking that quite a lot. Um, and finally, Jane gave him a, a son in 1537. Um, and he got, he, he got his male heir, Edward. Henry was delighted 
because, as we know, um, Jane died a few we weeks later. Now, how did they tackle the birth announcements for Edward? So, uh, again, these are um, created before the birth. And um, line three in the middle, there is the word prince. You might be able to see that. I'm sorry if you can't. And then a, a, quite a big gap after it because the scribes weren't going to be caught out twice running by that problem but of course they didn't need it because he was a boy anyway and this one stresses that um, Edward was conceived in the most lawful matrimony and I think that's really reflects the fact that both the um, Henry's previous wives were dead at this point, so there was no, none of the problem of, about um, Catherine of Aragon still being alive when, when um, Anne became queen and had the baby. And again, there are quite a number of these. This is another one. Um, and again, you can, in line three, you should be able to find a gap in the middle. This one was found very recently at Dunham Massey House in Cheshire um, and was sent to the person um, whose family built that house. Now, let's, let's move to Hertfordshire and the royal nursery houses. Um, this we all know and love. Um, all the people in this talk would, would have known the middle part of this building, obviously, because it's the part of the gate. It's the gatehouse to the castle. Unfortunately, the brick tower which Henry had built um, on the curtain wall of the castle no longer survives today. But you can see where the wall turns into brick, and it, it was there. So. Let's have a look at these children. This is Mary, aged about nine. Mary was a lot older than her half-brother and sister. For six, for six years, she was brought up by a woman called Lady, Lady Brian, who had been a lady-in-waiting to Catherine of Aragon. And Lady Brian went on to bring up both Elizabeth and Edward too. Mary was the only one of these three children who actually um, knew their mother during their childhood. I mean, Elizabeth was less than three when her mother was executed. Um, Catherine of Aragon taught Mary and um, was guided by expert advice from Spain. Mary learnt Latin, French and Spanish and was very musical. Now let's move to um, Hatfield where Elizabeth grew up. This wing which you all I'm sure recognise is what's left of a house which was four sides round a courtyard so it's about a quarter of the original palace. Um, and really, Henry very rarely came to see Elizabeth. Uh, some people th think he might have felt guilty about having deprived this child of her mother. But um, actually, it's more likely that Henry just didn't want to think about that second marriage at all. Um, and it's interesting, they, there are no pictures of Elizabeth as a little girl at all. We have no image of her till she got into her teens, and um, quite possibly none were ever made, because um, she was really persona non grata. To, to the Tudors at this point. So, 
I'm sure you know this view as well in, inside um, the, the Hatfield Palace. Lady Bryan writes about Elizabeth as a baby. God knoweth my lady hath great pain with her teeth, which come very slowly. This makes me give her her own way more than I would. I trust God, her teeth were well grafted. I trust the king's grace shall have great comfort in her grace, for she is as toward a child and gentle of condition as I ever knew in, in any in my life. And now let's go to our third palace, which is Hunsdon. Um, this is a detail from a portrait of Edward, which we'll look at later on, um, but shows Hunsdon in about 1546. Um, obviously, the church survives today, but the, the house is about a quarter of the size of the, that it was in Tudor times and has been rebuilt, rebuilt very heavily over the centuries. Um, so is not terribly helpful for the, um, fi finding out about the Tudor house. Lady Bryan writes from Hunsdon in August 1536 to Thomas Cromwell. When my Lady Mary was born, the king appointed me Lady Mistress, and so I, I have been a mother to the children his grace have had since since. Now my Lady Elizabeth is put from that degree she was in. And what degree she's in at now, I know not. I beg you she, she may have raiment, that's clothes, but for she has neither gown nor kirtle, nor petticoat, nor linen for smocks nor kerchiefs, bodices, sleeves, nightgowns, handkerchiefs, mufflers, nor nightcaps. Um, it's funny to, to think of Thomas Cromwell ki kind of gathering all these things for a child and sending the, them off to Hatfield. And now let's turn to Edward. Um, this is a portrait, again by Holbein, of Edward, um, uh, just over a year old in 1538. And the Latin bit underneath him um, in, you know, exhorts him to be like her, his father. Um, this is Lady Bryan's description of Edward in 1539. My Lord Prince's grace is in good health and merry as would to God the king's grace had seen him yesternight, for his grace was marvellous pleasantly disposed. The minstrels played, and his grace danced and played so wantonly that he could not stand still, and was as full of pretty toys as I ever saw a child in my life. And I think she got them off to really quite a good start in a, what would be a very strange life for all of them. So, this is what happens when they start getting older. Particularly for Mary, the tensions of the adult world started to impinge on her um, when she reached her mid-teens. Here is a drawing that may or may not be of her, I have to be not honest. Um, when Henry wanted to divorce Catherine of Aragon, he separated, he separated her from her daughter. Um, so in 1531, from then onwards, Mary was not allowed to see her mother, and from um, December 1533, Mary was declared illegitimate. Um, the king 
ordered Lady Brian that Mary was not to have her own household anymore, but to be with her baby sister. Mary was always to be treated as second to her sister, um, even though she was much older, obviously, and had, had been up to that point heir to the throne. Um, so Elizabeth was always given the grandest chair um, in the room to sit on, and Mary had to travel behind her sister um, when they went on the journey. And of course, that all changed when Anne Boleyn was executed. After that, Mary had Hunsdon as her main home. Um, and this was the point at which Henry was making people swear oaths of supremacy and succession, declaring him to be head of the church in England and um, that Catherine of Aragon had never been lawfully married to him, thereby making um, Mary illeg illegitimate. Mary refused to swear, um, and her mother wrote to her secretly, advising, answer with few words, obeying the king, your father, in everything, save only that you will not offend God. And Mary found that impossible to do in the end, that she was put under so much pressure. So she didn't see her mother from 1531 onwards and was not even allowed to um, attend her mother's funeral in 1536. Now, this is a really important document and uh, sadly, about 200 years later, um, that these, this set of documents were damaged in the fire. Um, luckily, uh, it had been t transcribed because it was so important before that, so we knew what she said. It's sometimes called the submission of Mary, um, and it's when she gives in to her father. So she ri Mary writes that she prostrates herself before the feet of your most excellent majesty, your most humble, faithful, and obedient subject, which has so extremely offended your most gracious highness that mine heavy and fearful heart dares not presume to call you father. I acknowledge myself to have most unkindly and unnaturally offended your most excellent highness in that I have not submitted myself to your most just and virtuous laws. And she signs it from Hunsdon this Thursday at 11 o'clock at night, your grace's most humble and obedient daughter and handmaid, Mary. And she swears the oaths, um, dis declaring herself illegitimate and demoting the Pope to be merely Bishop of Rome um, while Henry becomes head of the church in England. This is Mary a little bit later on in 1544, painted by a painter called Master John. Both Mary and Elizabeth had their titles of princess removed from them when they were declared Ill illegitimate and were, they were both just called Lady instead. It, you probably can't see, but she's, the writing calls her Lady Mary in this picture. Edward was o often living at Hunsdon too and wrote to Mary that he loved her the most of his two sisters and took special content in being with her. Okay. Turning to Elizabeth, um, this is a book that Elizabeth made as a New Year's gift to her father with prayers in Latin, French and Italian. This is the final page of it um, and you can see 
the, that um, it's written in Harford um, and finished on the 30th of day of December 1545. Um, and both she and Edward had very good tutors, so um, they could speak a number of different languages and write in those languages. And Elizabeth probably sewed, I almost certainly sewed the book cover for this book with H's for Henry, um, as you can see here. And it's now in the British Library. So Edward and Elizabeth both exchanged portraits with the each other around this time. We can date Edward's portrait to about 1546 and no later because he's still Prince of Wales, which you can see he's got Prince of Wales feathers on his pendant, but I think actually that that will be a bit small for you to see where, where you're um, sitting. Um, and the books in Elizabeth's portrait are probably Bibles. Both of these portraits, this is fascinating, were painted on boards cut from the same tree. And they're both in the royal collection still now. Um, in 1547, Elizabeth sent a portrait of herself to her half-brother, Edward, um, which was probably based on this image. These two are, are both by William Scrotts, who was the, um, the, the king's painter. Um, and she sent with it a letter to Edward, um, which says a lot about her. This, this is very fascinating. So th this accompanies the po portrait. For the face, I grant, I might well blush to offer. But the mind, I shall never be ashamed to present. For though from the grace of the picture, the colours may fade by time, may give by weather, may be spotted by chance, yet the other, that's her mind, nor time with her swift wings shall overtake, nor the misty clouds may darken, nor chance with her slippery foot may overthrow. And this was sent from Hatfield, this 15th day of May, your majesty's most humble sister and servant, Elizabeth. And finally, um, in this section, a, a family portrait. Uh, the woman by Henry VIII is Jane Seymour, of, who obviously was long dead, but is important in the story of the family. Um, and, and she's placed there on the other side from Edward. In about the same at about the same time, 1543-4, Henry passed an act of succession. This was a, his third act of succession, laying it out. And this is what he said, if Edward died without children, first Mary and then Elizabeth would inherit the throne. Meanwhile, the children were still in this area, but were being moved around a lot. Here's a list of the places w where Edward was living from late in 1545 to early in 1547. So in November 1545, Edward is at Hunsdon. On the 11th of January in the next year, he moves to Hertford Castle. By the 8th of May, he's back at Hunsdon again. And on the 4th of July, 1546, he's visiting his father, the king, in London or Westminster. 
Then he comes back to Hertfordshire and he goes to the Moor in Palace in Rick, Rickmansworth. And then by the 20th of August, he's at Hatfield with his sister Elizabeth and stays there actually for quite a long time um, till early December when he comes back to Hertford Castle. Edward writes to Elizabeth in Latin from Hertford Castle on the 5th of December 1546 in reply to a letter from her. The change of place, my dear sister, does not upset me so much as your separation from me. It is a comfort to my sorrow that I hope shortly to see you again if no unforeseen accident happens to either me or you. But an unforeseen accident was about to happen. But it wouldn't have been unforeseen to the adults involved. Um, while Edward is here at the castle, his fa father dies. Um, he doesn't get told immediately that this has happened. Um, and he's, he, he's nine years old at this point. Um, so, coming to the throne. So how do these relationships be built up in this area between the three half-siblings alter when they come to the, the throne? Um, religion was the main battleground between them, with Edward and Elizabeth both Protestant and Mary a Roman Catholic. Um, they, they actually come to the throne in the order that that Henry has laid out, but um, there's quite a lot of tension before that actually happens. Edward never returned to Hertford Castle, um, but gave it to Mary. During Elizabeth's reign, we know that Parliament came here when there was plague in London, as did the law courts. Um, so Elizabeth was kept a link with, with Hertford. Um, so we have Parliament Square and que the Queen's Bench, which ev everybody thinks is a, something nice for her to sit on um, up the hill, but probably actually was the Queen's Bench Law Court, wh which was there. This is Edward's diary, um, which he starts to write as he comes to the throne. I, I'm, bet his tutors had something to do with it. And it's slightly strange because it's written in the third person. It makes it sound very distant and, you know, not, not him, but it is, it is genuinely written by him. He writes, after the death of King Henry VIII, his son Edward, Prince of Wales, was come to at Hertford and afterward were brought to Enfield, where the death of his fa father was first showed him. And the same day the death of his father was showed in London, where was great lamentation and weeping, and suddenly he was proclaimed king. What this diary doesn't tell you was that Elizabeth was already in Enfield, which is why they took Edward from here to there, and both children were told of their father's death together. It, it's described as being shown the, to them, but that actually means, you know, told, explained to them. Um, according to the people there, when they were told that their father had died, but both children cried and cried. Edward doesn't say anything about that, though he records the people in London crying. Um, and this painting is quite a good summary, if you like, of, of some of the things that happened while, while Edward was king. So here you have Henry VIII in bed dying, pointing to his son and heir, Edward. 
Edward, as I said, was nine, so he needs a council um, to oversee what he does. So that, that's all of those guys sitting around the table. Um, you can see that the, monk, the, the Pope and the monks are still being driven out of, of England. And the large book in the, in the middle is, um, reflects the fact that the, not just the Bible, but the prayer book was in English as well in Edward's reign. And up in the top corner, um, you can see the um, destruction of Roman Catholic images under the um, Protestant rule of Edward. Mary re remained a Catholic through all of this. Um, both sisters now had to kneel in front of their brother, the king, and obey his commands. <laughs> Mary caused Edward a lot of, of concern and trouble. In the end, he so wanted to stop Mary being made queen that um, he tried to change the succession. And we have um, Lady Jane Grey have, being the nine days queen. And he cut out both his half-sisters, Mary and Elizabeth, from the succession. It all failed, as we know, and um, Mary became the first queen to rule this country in her own right. This is um, a description in his diary of a meeting between Edward and Mary in 1551. He complains, how long I have suffered her mass in the hope of her reconciliation, and how now there being no hope, as I saw by her letters, unless I saw some speedy amendment, I couldn't bear it. She answered that her soul was God's and her faith she would not change, nor hide her opinion with dissembled doings. I said I didn't constrain her faith, but willed her only as a subject to obey and that her example might, might breed so much inconvenience. Mary, at the, this point, retreated to Copt Hall, um, which I think because it's got um, Epping Forest between it and London, was, that, that was quite a good barrier. Um, and, and she try, more or less tried to disappear her, her, there. Um, but Edward wouldn't give up, and he sent three of his privy councillors to her to try and persuade her to use the prayer book in English, because that was now the, a legal requirement in England. She again refused to accept that he was capable of deciding religious matters because of his young age, saying, rather than she will agree to use any other service than that which was used at the death of the late king her father, she would lay her head on a block and suffer death. But when the king's majesty shall come to such years that he may be able to judge things for himself, his majesty shall find me ready to obey his orders in the religions. So the three privy councillors had to take that message back to Edward. She was um, not going to cooperate. And by, 15, by 1553, Elizabeth is really worried that Edward is ill. She tries to go and see him, probably at Whitehall or at Greenwich, um, but he refuses to let her come anywhere near. She can only go home and write to him instead. She writes, For if your grace's advice that I should return, whose will as a commandment had not been, I would not have made half of my way the end of my journey. And thus, as one desirous to hear of your majesty's health, though unfortunate to see it, I shall pray 
that God forever preserve you. From Hatfield this present Saturday, your majesty's humbled sister to command Elizabeth. And she was right to worry about his illness. She never saw him alive again. He died soon afterwards. Mary actually did manage to go and see him, but they was, but there was no way that either of them would give in to the other. And I don't know what terms they um, parted on, um, but that was it. And here is Mary in her coronation robes in 1554. Elizabeth, as a Protestant, is now finding herself in extreme danger from her Catholic half-sister, Queen, um, Queen Mary of England, um, who wants to return England to Roman Catholicism. Um, she acknowledges the Pope at the, at the the head of the church once more and marries a Catholic king, Philip of Spain, 11 years younger than herself. She rules England together with him. Um, she brings back church services in Latin, uh, forbids priests to marry, executes nearly 300 Protestants and about 800 more fled abroad. She dies in 1558, still without any children to succeed her. So her project to take England back to being a Catholic country um, is, is uh, totally destroyed. After the Lady Jane Grey episode and, and then Wyatt's rebellion, Mary wants to move Elizabeth to the Tower of London because she sees her younger half a half-sister as the focus for Protestant plots against her Catholic regime. And Elizabeth writes a long letter to her sister calling the tower a place for a false tra traitor and not a true subject like herself. She actually survives being kept in the tower. I mean, it was very touch and go whether she would ever come out again. Um, but Mary then keeps it, her under house arrest in various parts of the country. Um, famously, at um, Woodstock, she writes on the pane of glass with a diamond, much suspected of me, nothing proved can be, quoth Elizabeth Prisoner. And this is the letter that... Um, Elizabeth sends to Mary, begging her not to send her to the tower. Um, David Starkey again calls it the letter of her life. And Elizabeth is clearly worried that somebody will interfere with th this, uh, which is why she's struck through all the unused paper on, on, on this letter so that nobody can add anything. Here are a couple of... of quotes from it. I am by your, ca your counsel from you commanded to go under the, under the, the tower, a place more wanted for a false traitor than the true subject, which though I know I deserve it not, yet in the face of all this realm appears that it is proved. And she finishes off also, I most humbly beseech your highness to pardon this my boldness, which innocency procures me to do, together with hope of your natural kindness, which I trust will not see me cast away without desert. And, of course, um, Mary's response is to send her to the, the tower. This letter is called the Tide Letter because Elizabeth was very canny and didn't send it till the tide in the Thames had turned so that there was no way that she could be taken to the tower that day because she wouldn't have got through Tower Bridge with the way the tide was. Um, but the next day that she was there.
Elizabeth was at Hatfield in 1558 when the news came to her that Mary had died and that she was now the Queen. It's said that she was sitting under an oak tree. Um, it was mid-November, I'm not sure that she really was, but it, it's a good story. Um, and when the message arrived and told her the news, she said, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvellous in our eyes. The oak tree has now died. That's a drawing of it on, on one side. But, I mean, some of the other, other oak trees in Hatfield Bark are um, 500 years old, like it. They're, they're, they're some still there. This is Elizabeth at her coronation. Um, in her coronation robes, but they're not her coronation robes, they're Mary's. Elizabeth was always incredibly prudent and um, it's e e phenomenally expensive material with gold and s real gold and real silver in it. Um, and she just had her um, sister's coronation robes altered to fit her. And finally, I want to show you this painting, um, which was commissioned by Elizabeth um, and given to her spy master, Sir Francis Walsingham, in 1572. And it shows very clearly what Elizabeth thought about herself and about her Tudor family history. Um, there are various versions of this, and the later versions, her clothes are changed to be f more fashion up to date and fashionable. Um, but that um, uh, it, they, um, this is the original one. It shows people you should probably recognise. So Henry, Edward, Elizabeth, Mary, Mary's husband, Philip, but also some allegorical figures as well which give you a flavour of how Elizabeth sees Tudor history. So, Mary and her Spanish Catholic husband bring Mars, the good god of war, with them. Um, Elizabeth, meanwhile, ushers in Peace, whose hand she's holding. Peace has got weapons under, and, 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 and underneath her feet. And she brings in cor um, uh, Plenty, who's holding a huge cornucopia be behind her. And the c composition is really interesting. So if you see where people are overlapping, um, this, this is the Protestant side. And the on the Catholic side, there's a huge gap between Henry and his daughter. I think, actually, in reality, Henry was much more in the middle between Protestantism and, and Catholicism. But, obviously, Elizabeth wants to co-opt him to the Protestant side. Um, and, yeah, it's very fascinating to, to see into Elizabeth's mind in this way. Um, and it, this brings us back to the start, to Henry and his um, three children. And the huge irony about the whole of this is that Henry's obsession with her having a son um, was, in, in effect, totally useless because his most successful child... Um, and, and successor was um, Elizabeth, you know, the daughter who had been pretty well rejected from a very young age um, and, and had probably the most inauspicious childhood of all three of them, um, then becomes one of our greatest monarchs. Thank you very much.
Many thanks, Claire.